sometimes we experience our greatest attacks right when we are the closest to our calling. Sometimes the night is the darkest right before the dawn. And I believe every one of us here experiences prolonged waiting in certain areas of our life where for other people it's easy to get that blessing breakthrough. But for us, it takes long. Uh, first time that I came, in experience with, came to experience that, when I was younger, we were praying for this thing called baptism of the Holy Spirit where you receive the gift of tongues. And we were 14, 13 year olds, uh, year olds and everybody got it in the first meeting. And I actually went with the anticipation that I'll get it before them. Maybe it's a little pride or something. It took me six months to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's like God just extended that. You know, a lot of churches start and they grow right away. And you know, it took us decades before we experienced breakthrough. Some people get pregnant. They don't even realize they're pregnant. I know one couple went on a honeymoon, wasn't planning for children, came back already pregnant. Took us 13 years. So maybe you are here today and you're in one of those places in your life where an area of your life takes very long and it gets harder and harder and harder. You're not alone. David received the promise from God he will be a king and his life started to move toward kingdom. He was no longer with the sheep, now he was playing music for the king. And so David kills the Goliath and then what begins to happen is after that his life changes. I mean he becomes the poster boy of courage. We still you know refer to David and Goliath's story. After that he becomes David's armor bearer like a security guy, private security. And then after that he becomes a general. I mean life couldn't get better for David. And then David gets married to Saul's daughter. I mean that's it. He's pretty much linked. He's gonna be the next king. It's obvious. And the best friend of David is Jonathan who's next in line for the kingdom. Everything couldn't go better than the way it was going for David until everything starts going wrong. Saul decides to be jealous of him, become suspicious of him, wants to destroy his reputation and then throws spears at him, sends assassins to David's house to kill him and then spends the rest of his life trying to destroy David's life. And David's life gets really, really, really hard. And he gets tired until one day he said this, David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel and I will slip out of his hand. Write this down. Discouragement can come from trusting in God for continual deliverance. Now, trusting in God brings hope, yes. But trusting in God continually for the same thing can wear a person out. When a person doesn't see results, when they don't see any breakthrough, when they don't see any change in their life and they're just trusting in God, even someone like David came to that conclusion. This is not a good state that David was in, but we do have to acknowledge his humanity. And he says, you know, one of these days, God's gonna probably maybe fail me. Or one of these days, you know, I'm just kind of tired of doing this thing. So, and guess what David does? David goes and he joins the Philistines. Do you remember who David killed? Goliath was the Philistine. He's most wanted in the Philistine territory. And David shows up to the Philistines and pretends to be a madman crawling on the walls because he knew, he was smart. He knew that they don't kill mad people there. They don't kill mentally ill people. So he knew that they're not going to kill him. They're just going to think he's crazy. He goes in there, pretends to be crazy. He tries to fit in and the Bible says that Saul stopped chasing him. But God also stopped speaking to David. If you look at David's chronology, you will see this. At this point of his life, David is no longer getting Psalms. David is no longer speaking to God. You're not seeing any prophetic utterances. You're seeing David is submitted to uncircumcised ruler. David becomes a mercenary who fights for profit, not for honor. He lied for favor. No record of any Psalms. It was the lowest point of his life spiritually. How did this point came into his life? Discouragement from continually trusting in God for deliverance. Disappointment can do more damage to you than the devil. 
if you allow it. Discouragement, if allowed it, it can drive you to do things that even the enemy couldn't make you do. Saul could never make him pretend to be mentally ill and join the opposite side. But disappointment, discouragement did that to David. And David joined the other side. And David started to fight for money, no longer for honor. David pretty much has this broken connection to the Lord now. We don't see any Psalms. You don't see David is at the lowest point of his life, spiritually. He comes back home. He finds out his wife is taken. His children, his whole family is captured and his city is burned down. And the scripture says while this is happening, the men of David said, let's kill David, take his head off. It's always the solution. Kill the leader. And the Bible says this, now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved and every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. My today's message is going to be strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. I want you to notice what David does not do. The Bible says when David lost everything, David does not ask God for direction. He doesn't ask God for wisdom. He's not asking God right now for instruction. He is strengthening himself in the Lord his God. When you are worn out, and the Bible says in Daniel that the devil in the last days, he speaks against the things of God and it says this, and he will speak words against the Most High and he shall wear out the saints of Most High. When the devil cannot break you down, when he cannot knock you out, he will wear you out. And he can wear you out by your continual waiting for God's breakthrough. You can naturally become so worn out by not seeing that breakthrough that if you are not careful, the enemy will present a plan and he says there is an easier way, there is a more less battly way, less tense way. There is an easier way that you can adopt your life into where it does not require tension, doesn't require resistance, doesn't require constantly being you know actively involved and not seeing results from God. There's an easier way to live your life. And David chose the easier way but the Bible says an easy way leads to death not to breakthrough. The Bible says the broad way leads to death does not lead to breakthrough. And David ends up in a place where he is in a breakdown. He loses everything that he has. And instead of saying, God, why did you do it? This is wrong. What is happening to me? David doesn't blame himself. The scripture says that David strengthens himself in the Lord his God. I personally have experienced few times in my life of that feeling. I'm not saying I experienced my wife's being taken because I don't have wives. I have a wife one and or children or city being burned down. But the feelings were the same where you are distraught, where you're discouraged, where your feelings are all over the place, where your thoughts are judging you or coming against you. The enemy is whispering in your ear. And then what I found out a lot of times, there's a temptation in desperation to seek instruction from God on what to do next. When you are really broken, when your life is falling apart, your emotions are like a sea. It's going all over the place. A lot of times we're like, God, what do I need to do? Tell me what to do. Uh, speak to me, God. And usually you find out God doesn't speak. King Saul experienced a similar thing in the chapter before when the Philistines were coming against Saul and Saul who wasn't close to God, he said, Lord speak to me and God didn't speak to him. So he got so desperate to hear from God that he went to a witch and Saul didn't like witches. Saul cast witches out so he didn't want to do anything with witchcraft but in his desperation to hear from God, he went to witchcraft. He didn't go to a witchcraft because he wanted to do witchcraft. He went to witchcraft because he wanted to hear God. He was desperate to hear God. But see, you must understand, if you want to hear God, you got to get near God. Many of us in desperation say, God, give me a strategy. What do I do? God, give me a solution. God, to bring a solution. But see, many times you must understand, God might not give you a strategy before He gives you strength. 
God wants to give you a strength before He gives you a solution. So if you find yourself depleted, discouraged, worn out, and you're tired, you're like, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. What do I do, God? Come on, God. I want to let you know, most likely heaven is not going to speak. So what do you do? You got to find your strength. Because when you find strength, you find strategy. When you find strength, you find solution. When David strengthened himself in the Lord his God, then the Bible says David inquired of the Lord and the Lord spoke. Find your strength and you will find your solution. How do you find your strength? Here are five things that you and I can do today to find our strength. Number one, sing. David said, the Lord is my song and my strength. Something happens when you're depleted. Your sound can change things in the spirit realm. Your feelings are like this. Your thoughts cannot be trusted. Your circumstances will lie to you. Everything will seem just crazy. But there's something happens when you sing to the God. At that moment, you are not going to feel like singing. The only singing you and I will feel like at the time maybe is that country song where the truck is broken, the girl broke your heart, and then you truck beer and the broken heart. And that's really the only song you're like, man, I just want to medicate myself with those sad, sorrowful songs. But those sad songs, they'll make you feel good. They'll never change your life into good. You got to learn to sing at that moment. Sometimes you're so weak, you can't sing. Turn on the worship song and let the worship song sings, sing and let it get into your ears. And just let it sing. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. And guess what begins to happen? The Bible says God who is holy enthrones the praises of His people. The presence of God begins to descend in the room where the worship is happening. And it's going to start rubbing off of you. And if that worship starts happening with you, something will begin to happen. The presence of God will change your perspective and your atmosphere will begin to change in your heart. Have you ever taken an aeroplane and you've noticed when the aeroplane goes up, everything becomes smaller? The aeroplane does not reduce things, it's that your perspective begins to change. When the problems seem bigger than you, when your feelings are crazy, when there's like waves just hitting you everywhere and the sea is roaring and you're seeing like just everything seems to be going against your life is just falling apart and then your own guilt comes in because you feel like you contributed with lack of discipline, lack of this and all of that is begins to swamp just coming at you. Guilt and shame is not going to get you out. The Bible doesn't say and David felt bad for himself. The Bible doesn't say and David felt guilty for himself. The Bible doesn't say, and David blamed himself. See, when you are in that place, there's no room for blame game. You can't win if you're going to blame yourself. You're going to strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. And the way you do this, you got to open up your mouth. And many times when you sing to God, you don't have to sing out loud. You don't have to sing perfectly, but sing enough that your thoughts get disturbed. Where your emotions get stabilized. And the presence of God comes into your heart and it comes into your mind. Sing. Sing to God. Because that will shift something inside of you. Worship is like water. It replenishes you spiritually. The Bible doesn't say, and the Lord strengthened David. The scripture says, and David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. When you're a baby Christian, God will give you a bottle. The moment you're no longer a baby, God doesn't give you a bottle. He makes His presence and His power available, but it's up to you and I to receive it. You know, I, I have a boy and all he needs to do is ah! and everyone stops what they're doing and he gets a bottle. Now, I'm 37 years of age. If I want something, I don't do ah! When I was 17 years of age, if I wanted a steak, I didn't go Because ah! if I did that, I wouldn't get a steak, I would get a belt. Because my parents were traditional. They believed in not sparing the rod. Come on somebody. Milk, you get. 
meat, you go and get it. God gives His strength, makes His strength available. He does not give you that strength like milk. You have to strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. If you don't tap into that strength by making a decision to sing, you will suffer in weakness. Not because God is in making you strong, it's that God expects you as a mature believer to now lay hold of that strength. And how do you do that? You worship Him in the midst of that situation. Amen. Amen. You want to be strong in God when everything around is falling apart? Learn to sing to God. You were like, but I'm not a big worship guy. You're a child of God. You're a worshiper. Everyone is a worshiper. The reason why some of us have nothing to give to God in regards to worship is because we worship television or we worship football or we worship sports. We got American idols. We have idols in our culture that we worship. And when you take worship from an idol in this culture and you will have it to give it to God, you'll give it to the Lord and you will begin to see that your life will begin to change. Your heart will begin to change and you will find strength as you give your song to God. Amen. Number two, not only we sing to God, but number two is we also have to speak in tongues. The scripture says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Uh, Isaiah 28 verses 11 through 12, it says, For with stammering lips, lips and another tongue he will speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Something happens when we speak in tongues. Not think in tongues. The Bible says to sing in tongues, speak in tongues, and to pray in tongues. Verbal. So not only we sing worship songs to God, but we speak in tongues. Now, we are a uh, full gospel believing, tongue speaking, devil casting out church. We believe in all of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the parts of the Holy Spirit that make other people uncomfortable. We believe in that. And not only we believe in that, we practice that. Now, if that offends some of you and maybe you think the Holy Ghost is weird, no, He's not weird, but He is wild. Holy Spirit is a wild wind. He's a mighty, powerful Holy Spirit and we love the Holy Spirit. We also are not ashamed to speak in tongues. And I believe if Jesus said, those who believe in me will speak in tongues, there's importance in that. Why is the tongue speaking very important when you are worn out? It's because the Bible says, he who speaks in the tongue edifies himself. Now I grew up in a very more of a traditional Pentecostal circle where you spoke in tongues when the Holy Spirit filled you. Meaning you don't speak in tongues at will, you speak in tongues when the presence of God comes in the prayer meeting and then you're like, it's like bottles up, like bubbles up inside and then like it like really bubbles up, feels really, 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 really good and then it just takes over and then when it stops, you stop speaking in tongues. Pretty much it's out of your control. It will be more like Holy Spirit does the speaking in tongues and you're just a passive participator. But Paul in here doesn't say, if the Holy Spirit speaks in tongues, He will edify you. He says, you speaking in tongues, edify yourself. See, having the gift of tongues and having the Holy Spirit doesn't make you spiritually strong. If you do not speak in tongues and if you do not actively collaborate with the Holy Spirit. During COVID, me and my wife, we built a gym in our house. We have a gym in our house. It doesn't have any members. I mean, me and my wife are the members who have been as faithful in that gym as you have been in yours. <laughs> Very unfaithful. <laughs> Thankfully, my membership has not been revoked. <laughs> Having a gym in my house does not make me strong. <laughs> you actually have to go there. You actually have to exercise. See, same thing, just because you have the Holy Spirit, it doesn't make you strong. The Bible says that God want to, wants to strengthen you in your inner man through the Holy Spirit. But you do have a role to play. And one of those roles that you can do is you can speak in tongues. Now the Bible says we can pray in tongues. So as you are praying, pray in the Holy Ghost. But the scripture says we can also speak in tongues. That means as you are driving, pray in the Holy Ghost. The Bible also says you can sing in tongues. That means as you are 
you know, working on your garden, you can just sing melodies to the Lord in tongues. Now your mind is unfruitful, meaning your mind most likely will not know what's happening. But your spirit at that moment is getting built up. If you are weary and worn out, you have something you can build yourself up. Don't wait for God to pull you out. You can pull yourself out by the power of the Holy Spirit, by singing to God and speaking in tongues. Amen. Number three. Speak to your soul. And David did that a lot. In Psalms, you see Psalm 42. Starts really beautiful. David has this wonderful devotional time with God. As the deer pants for living water, so my soul thirsts, pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for the living God. Oh, when will, when will I come and appear before Him? You're reading this like, yes, I'm hungry for God. I'm thirsty for God. And next thing you know, why are you disquieted on my soul? Whoa, how did that happen? How did you go from I'm hungry for God to I don't feel God, I don't know what He's doing and I'm kind of disturbed right now. Have you ever had that in your life? What it seems like this <laughs> The soul has its own roller coaster. In one moment you're so sensitive to His presence, His presence is so near and next moment you don't even know if you're saved. You get these thoughts, you're like is life even real? Like, we're past flat earth. I just don't even know if, what if we're in the matrix right now? Not even sure if I'm real. Complete confusion. How could you go from, I hunger for God to, I don't know where He's at. It happens to spiritual people. Being spiritual doesn't mean that you don't have crazy emotions. It just means you don't live in them and you're not ruled by them. And you can actually speak to your emotions. You can speak to your soul. David did that. He says, why are you disquieted, O my soul? And then he said this, he says, hope in God, for I will yet trust in Him. Hope in God. This is what I realized when I was younger in faith, I lived in my emotions. I basked in them and I hoped that they would be good. Mostly they were not good. But when you grow in the Lord, you don't live in your emotions. You live with emotions, you don't live in them. And you can tell your emotions the Word of God. Now again, you don't necessarily during a dinner table, why are you disquieted on my soul? Probably not a good idea to do that. Because your family will think you're crazy and they will call a psychiatrist or a cop. He'll say he's hearing voices and speaking, but in your own quiet time, you can speak to yourself. David did that. He spoke to himself. That means there are parts of you that think, feel, moods. You are not those parts. You have those parts. You are not your thoughts. You have thoughts. You are not your emotions. You have emotions and you can speak to those emotions. Amen. Why am I saying you can speak to them? Because if we're not careful, people who are worn out, discouraged, disappointed, typically use their mouth to describe their situation instead of using their mouth to alter it. In this building, as I'm assuming you have in your car and in your house, we have this thing called a thermometer, thermostat that also serves as a thermometer. Thermometer is something that measures the temperature, tells us if it's hot or if it's cold. A thermostat is something that can set the temperature. Your mouth can be a thermometer. It constantly describes, I am sick, I am sick, and the doctor says this sickness will only get worse. That's a thermometer. Or you can use your mouth where the Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. So you can set the temperature in your life by your mouth. Now I'm not saying you can speak things into existence that are not there. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is when we speak things, we agree with God's Word. When I say I am strong, I'm not denying the presence of weakness. I'm not giving weakness a place of influence. Let me say that again. When I say that I am a healed person fighting sickness, I'm not denying the doctor's report and I'm not calling a doctor a witch doctor. I'm simply denying the place of that report, a place of influence in my heart. 
I'm aware of diagnosis. I'm aware of the weakness. I'm aware of the poverty. I'm aware of the situation. I'm just not giving this situation a place of influence. So my mouth is not to describe a situation. My mouth is to set the atmosphere that is different than this situation. If you come to your house and it's hot, then you can walk around and say, oh, it's hot, oh, I'm sweating, oh, it's hot, oh, I'm sweating, oh, oh, it's hot, oh, it's sweating. How many of you know by walking around and saying, oh, it's hot and I'm sweating, oh, it's hot and I'm sweating, the temperature will not change. And that's what many of us do. We think if as long as we can walk around, complain and whine, and God sees that we're really pitiful, God's going to have mercy on us. No, God won't. Because God isn't moved by pity, He's moved by faith. And you have to understand is that one of the ways the faith expresses itself is the faith has a voice. And faith doesn't glorify your feelings. It doesn't glorify your thoughts. It doesn't glorify your sickness. It glorifies God. It glorifies Jesus. It glorifies the promise and the power of God. And that's why what faith will do is the faith will not deny the problem. It just will not give the problem a place of influence. And it will say, I am healthy person fighting sickness. I'm a blessed person fighting poverty. I'm a strong person fighting weakness. That's faith. Now we're whining and complaining and a thermometer describing situation goes like this. Oh, just a sinner. Hope I'm saved by grace. One day, maybe I'll go to heaven. I'm just such a poor person. I just really, really wish God will change my situation. I'm ugly. I know that. Everybody know that. But I just don't want to be ugly. Nobody loves me. But I just hope one day somebody will love me. And we think the more pitiful, the more painful we describe the situation, the more somehow that's going to change. It won't. It's just pretty much walking around and say, it's hot, it's hot and I'm sweating. It doesn't change the weather. Oh, but it's just a bad weather. Well, most of us know in Tri-Cities, you have to have your own air conditioning in the house that doesn't reflect the weather, but reflects what you desire to have a weather and climate in your own house. You don't have to reflect the culture. You don't have to reflect what's happening to everybody. You have an air conditioning in your own heart called the Holy Ghost. And you can set the temperature by agreeing with God's Word. You can set the temperature by agreeing with God's promise. You can set the temperature by agreeing with what God says about you and walk in the authority that you have and now reflect the culture. That's why the Bible says, do not conform to the culture, but be transformed. Got your own therm thermostat in your own house. And guess how you set the thermostat? This book of the law, Joshua 1 8, shall not depart your, I'm hinting, mouth. Speak it. I'm not saying again. That's not real faith. When the doctor says, you have cancer. No doctor, I don't have cancer. That's not faith. That's a fantasy. What, is, what does faith do in that moment? You say, doctor, I thank you. You're doing your best job. I appreciate that. But what you don't allow is that report, that disease, to have a place of influence because the place of influence is reserved for by His stripes I am healed. I'm not a sick person trying to get healthy. I'm a healthy person fighting sickness. My identity is not my diagnosis. My identity is in Jesus. I've been crucified with Jesus. I've been buried with Jesus. I've been risen with Jesus and I walk with Jesus. So my identity is Jesus Christ. People identify with cats, dogs, opposite gender, same gender. I identify with Jesus. Jesus is my identity. So I speak Jesus. Somebody say, speak to your soul. Number four, we strengthen ourselves by strengthening somebody else. Strengthen others. Life is like tennis. Those who serve well seldomly lose. Serve others. All you got to do when you feel really, really bad Go find a homeless person, ask them their story and let them take you on the banner, uh, rabbit trail, buy him a sandwich, sit down next to him in that heat and for 10 minutes just sit with them, talk to them, hear them out. And if that's not enough, sign up for Gospel Mission, a union right here and just serve food one time a week. Go to a place in a hospital where somebody's fighting for their life and hopes to have an extra day. Find somebody that's hurting. One of the biggest things that many of us do when we are worn out is this, is we say, 
I need a break from serving. But you don't realize, serving is your shovel to get you out of the place that you are in and you're throwing it out. Serving is your key to get you out of the prison that you are in. I am not saying we shouldn't take break and we shouldn't pause and rest and grieve and all of that. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that many of us have over glorified our pain and caused our pain to become our prison. Joseph translated dreams while being in prison and he didn't say, well, God, sorry, sorry, bro. I, I can't tell you the interpretation of the dream. Why? Yeah, kind of God, pretty hurt by God. He gave me a dream when I was a teenager and yeah, look what I end up. Yeah, I don't, I don't tell other people dreams anymore. I don't believe in that stuff. Jesus, when he was being arrested and realized that Peter had an outburst of anger and cut another guy's ear off, Jesus didn't say, yeah, um, the healing anointing upon my life, um, office closed. Sorry, bro. You lost your ear. Yeah, I'm, I'm about to lose my life. Uh, sucks to be you. Deal with it. No, Jesus pretty much healed the guy while being arrested. He was so distraught during prayer before that. The Bible says his sweat was like a drops of blood and yet he could pause and heal a guy who was actually arresting him, heal him. This whole idea, I can't give what I don't have. It's kind of a fallacy because we don't give what we have. We give what Jesus has and he lives inside of us. So don't use the excuse of I can't serve. I can't sign up to serve. Why? I just, I'm just kind of been really going through a dry season. Well, you know how to find water at the dry season. The Bible says, he who waters others will be watered himself. There is something that exists when you strengthen others, God begins to strengthen you. When David strengthened himself in the Lord as God, the Bible says after that, before he recovered everything that he lost, he strengthened an Amalekite who actually held the key to David's future on how to recover everything that David lost. I mean, Jesus, imagine this, He's dying on the cross. This is not Him being arrested. He already got beaten. He already have a crown of thorns. He's already being accused of, making fun of. He's suspended between heaven and the earth. He feels the rejection. And the guy next to Jesus decides to have an altar call. He said, Jesus, is this too late? Uh, Want to be saved? Now, me being human, if that would be me, I will tell the guy to go to hell. I'll say, bro, get lost. Three years I had a ministry, you never showed up. I'm kind of dying. This is uh, very painful and it's not easy right now. I am not, I'm trying to focus, okay? I'm dying for the world. And there you are wanting to be saved. The Bible says Jesus in the middle of pain led him to salvation. Jesus didn't say, uh, you know, I'm kind of hurting right now. Yeah, ask one of my disciples. Oh, they're not here. I can't help you. Jesus helped them. I wonder how many of us would really shrink the difficult seasons of our life if we stop using them as an excuses for why we don't serve at the church and why we don't serve with our community and why we don't serve other people. There is strength in serving. There is no strength in self-pity. There is no strength, poor little me. There's no strength in that. But when you serve others, God strengthens you. And lastly, you strengthen yourself by subduing the enemy. James 4, 9, 4, 7, it says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What does this mean? when I'm talking about subduing the enemy. What I'm talking about is this, is when we're not dealing right now with the normal stress. We're dealing right now with demonic stress. Normal stress is this. It's when you have more load on you than you have strength to bear. That's normal stress. Stress in itself is not bad. Stress in itself is not bad. Stress simply means you got responsibilities and your strength is not up to part for that. So instead of praying, say, Lord, remove the stress. Lord, remove the stress in my life. If you pray that prayer, God's going to start removing your spouse, your kids, your job, everything. So don't pray that prayer. Amen. Instead, the Bible says, those who wait upon the Lord, He renews their strength. The Bible doesn't say God goes and starts removing their stress because your wife is the source of stress. Your husband is the source of stress. 
Your job is a source of stress. Your car insurance is a source of stress. Your business is a source of stress. Uh, church is a source of stress if you start getting involved and start serving. Anything that requires responsibility carries stress. So in order to say that I'm just going to get rid of all the stress in my life, you can't get rid of the stress in my life unless you become unemployed, divorced, but then you're going to have another problem, suicidal thoughts. Because you were not created to live your life doing nothing. You were created to create, to dominate, to subdue the earth and to just flourish as a human being. With it comes stress. So God comes to us and says, if you wait on me, God doesn't say, I'll make your life so pretty and so soft and so nice. No, God says, I'm going to strengthen you to make you stronger so you can meet the demands of life and responsibilities without falling apart. I'll teach you how to strengthen yourself. So that is normal stress. But sometimes we're dealing with not normal stress. We're dealing with demonic stress. I mean, I'm talking about this like third person voices coming from somewhere. Those things, what we do with those things is we have to understand when we strengthen ourselves in God through singing, through speaking in tongues, through speaking God's Word, through speaking to our soul, is we have to also learn to open our mouth and this is how many Christians handle spiritual warfare. Jesus, I'm under attack. Send one of your angels. It doesn't have to be one of the best ones. Just the ones that are available. One of them. Jesus, you don't have to send a lot of them. Just few of them. Could you take, let the devil get off of my back? It's just really hurting God. I'm just kind of, just kind of really just, just, you know, God, just, just help me, God. Just, just, just help me. And they think that the more pitiful they sound, the more pleasing it's going to be to God. And I, with respect, with respect to the contritness and the brokenness of your heart, I want to speak and let you know that God is building an army. And He is looking not for people with pacifiers, but He's looking for soldiers and He wants to build out of us soldiers. What does that mean? That means that God wants you to learn to strengthen yourself by what? You need to learn to resist the devil. Resisting the devil is not God take the devil away. It's you submitting to God and you opening your mouth and telling the devil to get lost. I know he can get lost so theologically it's not correct but you're telling the devil to get behind you. Get out of your way. You need to speak to the devil. Now some of, for some of you maybe here this is pretty like scary. You're like yeah I don't do that kind of stuff. I just talk to God and just God takes care of all my problems. But you must understand He gave you authority to trample upon snakes and scorpions. You have to understand He told you to stand still and that He will accomplish that victory. But you have a role to play. You got to resist the devil. Jesus in the wilderness, He didn't ask the Father to remove the devil. Jesus in the wilderness, He spoke God's Word and the devil left. The devil will leave. The devil will, is not persistent. The devil is not going to stick around your neighborhood for too long. But if he notices that you're one of those people that run from the battle and you are running from the devil, which the Bible never tells us to do. The Bible tells us to run from sin, not from the devil. And this is what's going to happen. The devil will bring other maniacs and he will turn your life into a nightmare. Somebody needs to get fed up and say, you know what, enough is enough and put up some resistance. And as you put up the resistance, He will flee. So let's say you got healed. First day you praise God. Tell, tell your friends, no more pain in my back. Praise the Lord. Three days later you get up. Oh, it came back. And then this is how usually people say, my back pain. When did you adopt that as yours? Why, why is it yours? Why is that yours? What, did Jesus give it to you as a gift? Or when did you adopt that as yours? And, or most of us will say, oh, I knew I, wa I wasn't healed. <laughs> I knew it, I knew it. I just, in the back of my head, I knew. I knew this whole healing thing is, is fake. I, I knew it, I knew it. Yep, let me call my doctor again and see that medication that I stopped taking. Where's that back? I know I flashed, down the, flashed it down the toilet, that, 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 that pain for, for my back. Let me go get it again. And understand, if that's your way of dealing with, with stuff, that's, that's one way. Let me give you another way. That pain starts to kind of come back. And instead of adopting it as your lost child, you can speak to it. And you can say, devil, leave my back alone. That pain is not mine. I've been healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ. And right now, I command those symptoms to leave in Jesus' name. I stand in God's promise for healing that I was healed, I'm walking in that healing and they will get you dirty hands off of my back in Jesus' name. Total different approach. You got delivered. The demons left. 
first night you slept so peacefully no more nightmares praise be to God for the first time you even gave a testimony and then on Wednesday that nightmare came back Ugh. Yeah, when is the next deliverance service? I need to go to the next, stand up for the next deliverance service. Why? I, that thing came back. Did it. What if it's the enemy on the outside? is messing with you. What if it's the enemy that you need to resist? He's no longer on the inside that you need to remove him through the act of deliverance. What if you stepped into the promised land now and you no longer need deliverance but you need to exercise your dominion? Because when the devil comes on the outside, when you remove him from the inside, he comes from the outside, wants to deceive us and trick us that he's on the inside and he wants to imitate, intimidate us and just kind of drive us crazy a little bit. And all we got to do is submit to God, strengthen ourselves in the Lord and we have to subdue him. That means put up a fight. Talk back to the devil. Speak God's word to him. That's what Jesus did in the wilderness. Now one little secret. You don't fight the devil. Usually it's in our head. The thoughts come in. The reason why devil doesn't come to you with an audible voice because it would be pretty defeating. If he comes to you and says, oh, I am Lucifer, you'll be running with the broom around in the house and three buckets of virgin oil pouring on him. So the devil knows. He doesn't stand a chance if he comes with an audible voice attacking you because you'll be like, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bind you right now. And you will turn out like three videos from YouTube where people are rebuking the devil. I mean, a devil will really run from your house. That's what I would do at least. So he won't be coming at me with, oh, you're the devil. Of course he's not going to do that. He's not a stupid. What he does is he masquerades as my own thoughts. And then I'm confused. I'm like, oh, this is me thinking. Oh, this is me thinking. As long as he takes the form of my thoughts, I'm accepting them as my own. It becomes a Trojan horse. And that's why we have to be smart as Christians and we have to be wise as Christians to understand that the devil is not going to attack you through many times audible voice. He will masquerade as your thoughts after deliverance, after healing, after the breakthrough. And so what you got to do is you got to discern that there are your thoughts and there are not your thoughts. And those that are not your thoughts, you don't try to fight them with your thoughts. You're like, my thoughts against their thoughts, let's have a thought battle. Anytime you go into a thought battle, everybody's going to lose. The devil's gonna win. So what you need to do in that moment is you got to open up your mouth and dis disrupt the whole thought thing in there. That's why Jesus, the Bible says, He said, it is written. Now some people say that the devil fought Jesus, you know, with audible voice and He showed up with the fork. I don't think so personally. The reason why is because in Hebrews it says that Jesus was tempted as we are and when I'm tempted, I don't see a, a guy with the horns. I just get thoughts, emotions and cravings and, and things that are just normal human, human stuff. And Jesus, I believe, was tempted like you and I were tempted. Most likely it came in the form of thoughts to Him. But Jesus Christ, He said, He said, He didn't try to, one thought against this thought. Okay, let me move this thought. I just punched that thought. Okay, let me punch the other thought. Let me, a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit harder. Okay, okay, okay. That thought is subdued now. No, no, no. We don't, we don't fight thoughts with thoughts. We fight thoughts with words. We speak the Word of God and when we speak the Word, you're putting a sword in that thought in the back of it and you're moving it, moving it and you're bringing it into obedience to Jesus Christ. You fight thoughts with words. You speak the words of Jesus. You speak the words of God and you put the dagger of the Spirit inside of that thought and you bring that thought into subjection of Jesus Christ. Speak to the devil. He's moving furniture in your house. Tell him to stop because you're paying bills, not him. And tell him to get out of the house and get his own house. He's messing with you. You tell him to stop. You tell him to stop in Jesus' name. And you put up a fight. Why? Because you're not a little spineless weakling. You're a child of God. Right? There is he that is inside of you and the one that's in the world. Why? Because God is building within you a mighty man and a woman of God. Amen. And what's going to happen you're going to change. You will get stronger and the enemy will flee. Jesus said he will flee. The scripture says David strengthened himself in the Lord is God and he went to war. He won that battle. In my Bible, that's the last chapter of David's misery. The next chapter, David becomes a king. I truly believe sometimes the hardest times will come right around where things are about to turn around. And what you do at that time, if you handle your difficult times with care, they'll become good times. How do you handle them? Strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. Don't wait for God to zap you with power. He has that power available to you, especially if you're not a baby Christian. 
Now, if you're a baby Christian, you know, just trust in Him. He'll take care of you. But if you've been around the block for a few years already, listen, sing to God. Get rid of that Taylor Swift and Rihanna and all of those, all of those people. Get rid of those people from your room. You know, you don't need more demons in your life. You need less of them. And so put in some worship songs, put in some, put in some stuff, create an atmosphere of presence of the Holy Spirit in your house and in your life. Secondly, open up your mouth and speak in tongues. Stop cussing. Stop exaggerating. Stop yelling at other people. Stop gossiping. And stop complaining. Start speaking in tongues. Make a habit. 10 minutes every day. I'm going to speak in tongues non-stop. Yeah, you probably don't want to do it in front of your family. You're just going to do it in your prayer time. But just speak in tongues. Number three, speak to your soul. When you, when you go all crazy, you speak to your crazy self and you say, listen, sit down. God is faithful. He's going to He's going to take care of us. He's going to lead you. Your emotions, no, 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 no. You're, you're not right. Your thought, your thoughts, you're, you're not right. Just, just sit down. Jesus is right. God's Word is right. And you, you're going to change tomorrow. Everything's going to be okay. Sit down. Thirdly, don't excuse yourself from serving. Don't sit and say, nah, I can't serve a church anymore. No, I'm not going to life group anymore. No, somebody's inviting you to maybe help somebody move. No, I'm just, just too depressed. Just going to eat another chip. It's going to go buy me another ice cream. You're numbing yourself, not nurturing yourself. No, I'm just going to watch, just, just, just glue myself to a television and just, just really, really just kind of, you know, uh, it's going to wind down. You're not winding down. You're, you're, you're getting deeper into a pit. No, say, hey, yeah, I'm coming. I'm going to go help. Yeah, I don't feel like doing it, but I'm a mature person and I don't have to do everything I feel like doing. I can do things that are right. And you'll come out from there like, man, I'm so glad I did it. How many people I've met who came to church and didn't want to come to church? And after that, they're like, you know what? I'm so glad I came. Something just broke off of me. Don't use, don't let the enemy lie to you. Even if on Saturday you did something that you're not proud of and you should have not done and everything, you're like, no, I can't go to church. I'm just going to take a week to really get cleaned up. Really? Have you ever used a dirty rag to clean a dirty window? That's not cleaning up. That's more mess. You run to church. You run to God and say, God, come on. You know, I screwed up, messed up. Help me. And God says, come on, let's reason together. If you're dirty and, and unclean, I'll help you. I'll wash you. I'll purify you. I'll give you power not to do it again. Amen. And lastly, if the devil sticks around your house and just lurks around and just, 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 just tell him to go. Just, just tell him to get off of your back and just go. Some of you know a story that I, I've shared. It's, it's my personal battle. As long as I remember, I battled with darkness. Like not spiritual darkness, like physical darkness. I was scared during the, dark, during the night. And uh, I was really afraid. Actually, I've never told anybody that I was scared until I got freed. Never told my parents. They didn't know. Sometimes I slept with my lights on. Even I was, when I was a youth pastor. Never told my wife when I married her. I mean, come on, I'm a man of God. I'm going to tell her I'm scared of the dark. I ain't scared of nothing. I cast out demons. I'm not scared of nothing. But I was scared of the dark. First year into our marriage, and I was a youth pastor before that, and, and when we were married, so many times as a pastor or a youth pastor, you're the last one to leave the church. So our youth night was over. I was usually the last one to check all the doors, and I'm not, I'm not gonna lie to you. It was one of the scariest things to do, to close the church, because I had to be the last one to turn off the light and then run to my car. Run. I ran to my car. You know what the first thing I did is I took the back seats. I think I watched too many movies of stuff happening in the back seats. And then what I would do is I would speed from the church. I mean, I would drive very fast from the church just in case some kind of a scary thing was chasing me that I would like get it faster and get it away from it. Faithful Saturday night, I'm preparing a sermon called Victory Over the Devil. As, even as I say it right now, I see the head title right now in my Word document. I'm preparing a title uh, for a sermon, Victory Over the Devil. My wife is doing some painting at the time when she was still painting and then we have a dinner and I kept seeing these dark figures in my house in my apartment we lived in this uh, low-income apartment so they didn't have lights in the living room but it wasn't why it was low income but it's just most apartments don't have lights in the living room so we're eating dinner and next thing that happens is that I keep seeing these figures like something is there and I kind of got spooked out so I turned to my wife and grabbed her hand we we're married for like six months and so she's like are you okay I'm like yeah, I just love you so much. She's like, you don't have to be like so aggressive about it. You know, maybe like a softer tone. So we finish eating and you know, my wife is taking her dishes to the sink and I'm following right after. I'm, I'm spooked out in my own apartment here on Chapel Hill. 
We go to the room, we turn off the lights everywhere and except in the room where Lana's finishing painting and I'm finishing my sermon. And so and my wife, as she's painting, you know, putting that final touches, she looks at me and she says, could you go get me water? Now mind you, I'm going to give you a map of the apartment. This means I have to go through the hall, there is no lights there. Go through the living room, there is no lights there. And there is light switch all the way by the kitchen. By the time I get there, like three ghosts will kill me. So I did the math quickly, I calculated my chance of dying that night. Every single chance I'm gonna, I, I really felt like something bad's gonna happen to me. So I said, honey, why don't we go together, get water. <laughs> me and you in the dark holding hands. Oh, what a romantic way to spend Saturday night and to walk in the hall of our own apartment on Chapel Hill in love. So my wife looked at me and she's realizing something's not right with this boy. <laughs> my wife knows how to make me submissive. She's like, go get water. I said, yep, I got it. I got it. Yep. <laughs> no romantic walks tonight. Just, just water. Just, I got it. Just water. And right when I'm about to get out of my room, I'm thinking I'm gonna run quickly to the kitchen. I hope that I don't hit any of the corners. Turn on the light, get the water, bring the water back, leave the lights on and have my wife turn off the lights before we go to sleep. <laughs> I did the math. And right before I do that, I hear the still small voice. Because for 10 years in my life, I always ran when I was scared. Always. Never once I confronted it. Never once. And I hear the still small voice that said, you are the light. You don't need to turn on the light. And I said, yeah, that, that's really cool. That's like in Matthew chapter 5. I know where it's written. You don't understand. This is Chapel Hill apartment. Stuff happens here. Like I'm going to die. <laughs> and it dawned on me. I've never confronted it my whole life. And I'm like, man, this is not our best time. It's Saturday night. It's like 11 o'clock. Like, do I really want to do it tonight? Let me just do it when it's like day. <laughs> when I feel better. I don't feel good right now. But I knew there will never be a right time. And that Saturday night around 11 o'clock or something, I went to that living room. I'm, that I have faith? Zero. I have faith that I'm going to die. But I knew it was the right thing to do. I went to the living room. I felt that fear. I felt those objects all around me. And this is what I said. I said, whoever you are, whatever you are, I pay rent in this apartment. I said, you don't. So you got to leave. And you're not welcome here in Jesus' name. That's, that was not a spiritual prayer. I don't know if it was because I was scared or something, but that's the prayer I prayed. And I confronted that day. And I stood there. I was like, I'm gaining water until you leave. Or this thing changes. And honestly, within about 30 to 60 seconds, something just like... And I never had that fear again for the rest of my life. Face the devil and tell him to get behind you. Tell him to get out of the way. Amen. Why don't you rise to your feet?